This is the End FGM podcast with Antonia Vaskoviak. If you then take something which is an act and it prohibits something what they have been doing for many, many, many years and which for them is normal and it's a, like a must to grow up and you tell them as a white person in a language in English and very difficult uh, spellings that they can't do this. Hey, you are chased away. <laughs> Welcome to the End FGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I spend time with change makers who are making an impact in Kenya and beyond. Each week, we listen to incredible stories of ordinary people just like you making a difference. They share their successes, failures, and what they are learning along the way. Thank you for being with me today. Let's get started. Today, we are having a conversation with Antonia Vaskoviak. She came to do community work as a volunteer in Kenya in the year 2011. Being a paramedic by profession, she would be helping patients receive immediate medical attention. However, at 26 years, she is running an organization and working against FGM in a country far away from home. Today, we focus on approaching, gaining trust, and working with an FGM practicing community when you are from another community or culture. Welcome to the NFGM podcast, Antonia. Let's begin with your journey. What made you join this campaign? When I first came to Kenya, I was 18 years. And I just heard about FGM when I was 17. I was still in high school and I found this work camp um, where I talked about FGM. So I really wanted to come and know more about it. You came in through an organization that organized basically um, exchange programs between Germany and Kenya. And you were able to live in a community at 18 years old, a community that practices FGM. And uh, FGM has been deep-rooted into their culture since it's something that has been passed down to them for many years. So you joined in as a volunteer. What were you doing in that organization then? Yeah, actually, we didn't do much about FGM like in the first day, uh, beginning, I was re somehow disappointed. But I later on realized why. Um, yeah, you know, we were like 15 Muzungus coming from other countries and we were working with the Korean community and also other uh, local volunteers who have been working with that organization. So basically we came to live with the culture and we were working in a primary school, uh, which was like, for very poor children and we were making bricks there that was basically the like it was community work what we started doing but then also um in the afternoons we were talking with families we were talking about fgm we were talking with the children and by that time it was in 2011 so it fgm was even still legal in kenya so nobody actually talked much about it and was questioning anything about fgm so even during that period, the Anti-FGM Act came out. And when it was released, um, I had like, like my, the volunteers, they were stand, like, they wanted to tell the community that whatever they are doing is wrong. <laughs> and I, like how they were standing and talking to the community, I was like, hey, you cannot, you cannot approach a community like this. You know, if you are a Mazungu, you're already, a different person and you are new in this culture you're visiting this culture and you are actually you are in the position like to learn from them so if you then take something which is an act and it prohibits something what they have been doing for many 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 years and which for them is normal and it's a like a must to grow up and you tell them as a white person <laughs> in a language in english and very difficult uh, like uh, spellings that they can't do this. Hey, you are chased away. <laughs> so this is what basically happened. The, the like my team was standing there with 
the people from within the community, the elders, the women, the men, and they were reading out the anti-FGM act. And people started throwing bananas and oranges to them. They started screaming and they, leave, they left the marketplace. I felt very embarrassed and I never wanted to read anything. But like what I wanted to do, especially on that day, I decided I have to come back here and I have to live with the community and see and find out why they are doing this right. And like I really wanted to understand why they are doing this. You know, you don't do something just because you feel like, ah, now I'm going to do this. I'm going to circumcise people. And because I think it's it's time to do that. It's It must have some reasons and some... Some meaning. Yes. What then after that? What did you do? When the when the act came out, it was like, I think one day before we left. That's the prohibition of the Female Genital Mutilation Act 2011. Yes, yes. On that day, I decided actually to to go back to my home country, finish my high school, and then I wanted to come back because I just wanted to live with the community and what can be done. Like I saw, you can't tell anyone not to do something they have been doing for a long time, especially as a white person or as someone from not from within the community. So I decided to go back to finish my high school education and I started my education as a paramedic. And um, then I, I came back. I was living in Korea for four months and I just lived with the community. I was helping out in a hospital, doing um, basic um, first aid and some medical treatments and Yeah, I was just us talking a lot to people and um, also to elders and see on what's exactly happening and like in a not in a very non-judgmental approach. <laughs> yeah. Four months in Kenya, you kept on working, volunteering in the hospital and also in the school. Then you went back home. I went back home, and uh, I don't know what always made me come back to Kenya, but I felt like. I still I still have something to do there and um I need I need to I don't know my life somehow takes place in Kenya and this was in 2012 when I went back no in 2013 and the school we were working in uh we like we made a lot of bricks there and then um what I realized by that time was that you can't tell anyone not to do or not to practice FGM but Education is a key to overcome FGM and to overcome any harmful cultural practices. So I really wanted to to focus on the education. And uh, the school where we have been do volunteering in, I like. Um, I also wanted to continue helping that school. So I was with the person who founded the school. He was actually the person who also taught me so many things in Kenya and he was such good hearted. Yeah, and that year, like in the four months, we built four classrooms and I was able to like get some um, financial help from fr family and friends in, in Germany. And um, like I didn't do, I didn't have any organization by that time. So I just tried to see what I can do by myself. And I went back. And then uh, he died. He then suddenly died. Like he was very sick. And actually, I came to Kenya because uh, of his funeral, because I was very close to him, and he was the person who I did everything with in in Kenya. So um, after the funeral, like we didn't know what to how to continue. Also, me, I didn't know how to continue with the what we started because I was somehow raising the school with him and. Uh, Now suddenly he was gone. I really wanted to continue what we started because it was his dream to put up that school and also to to uh, join the anti-FGM work in with the education. To use education to um, bring much more enlightenment and also trying to end FGM in, in Korea. Yes, yes, yes. That, that was my goal. In 2016, I founded the organization Zenduka in Germany because um, yeah, it was somehow necessary to, to grow and um, to make things official. So we 
yeah, as Sunduka also, like our slogan is education against mutilation, uh, which is basically the school education yeah, against mutilation. I think <laughs> that pretty much explains itself. We were able to raise the school and uh, like even already in 2016, it had, uh, I think, nine classrooms and a kindergarten. And we came from 80 children to now it's almost 360 children. So I think we really improved. And we have so many kids who are um, vulnerable and coming from poor backgrounds. And um, yeah, we, we joined the anti-FGM work. So what we then did is we we saw a need of like giving the 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 girls in the time when they are cutting, which is in Korea specific because uh, they only cut, cut during December every two years. So in 2014, 2016 and 2018, they have been cutting the girls during December. So we used the school as our shelter and we hosted the kids there so we just like we didn't we didn't take them from the parents we have just been working also with the parents and the children and we we told um, we went to churches to schools we did fgm classes and then we told the children okay if you are if you think you are not safe or um, also the parents if you think your child is not safe Please bring them to our shelter. How could that be? Parents, actually, the ones that keep the children safe. Yeah, but it's a tradition which is very deep rooted. So, especially the elders, the grandmothers, yeah, they are really pushing on continue practicing that culture. So, even if the parents maybe they are against, still the 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 grandparents or the uncles or whoever, uh, the clan of elders, they can come and they can take the, the child to, they just force the child to be taken to um, to the field and to be cut. So actually we have many parents who, are, who come with the children and they are scared that also their daughters are going to be taken. Like in December in 2018, we had one mother, she had an eight-year-old daughter and the, the, the cutting season was already going on. And our shelter was running for like, I think one and a half weeks already. And like the cutting season is about four weeks and we also have the shelter for the whole time. So after one and a half weeks, she came with her eight-year-old daughter and she, she told us all the friends of the daughter have been cut. So she's against her daughter being cut and also her husband is against. But she's really scared that also the community comes because of peer pressure and takes the child to be cut because all the friends of the child have been cut, so she was so afraid. And uh, so we just took the child also. Yeah, so it's not, it's not, of course we also have um, girls where the parents uh, are supporting the girl to be cut. And those ones are usually the, like, the children come by themselves or they are brought by, sometimes even the uncle comes or the grandfather. We also had a child where the grandfather came and was like, oh, the mother wants the daughter to be cut and the grandfather actually brought the child. So there it's very important to also work with the parents. Like we can't only focus, like in those four weeks, we really focus on the, on the children, the, the girls. They are being educated a lot and we teach them so many things. And, um, but also we call their parents like... We have community groups among their parents and uh, we try to empower them because in the end it's it's also the parents who are responsible. Like if the girl is not going to be cut, she has to be taken to school. And we as an organization, we are not able to pay school fees for the whole community. So we also want the parents to know that they are able to, to um, take their children to school if they don't cut them. So they also have to see the benefits of not cutting their kids. Yeah, so we are trying to work with everyone and uh, we are not always directly talking about FGM. If you just look and see what can be done, there are a lot of things, especially in Korea, like you can do a lot with agriculture and economic empowerment. And if you just show a few things to the parents or the elders, what they are, are able to do 
they really appreciate and they are really willing to do a lot. You approached FGM from an education perspective and then empowering the community in terms of the economic activities. How effective is that? Are there any successes that have come from that that would not have come if you had just gone directly preaching against FGM? I think it's all about sustainability. If you just preach about FGM, especially me, who was a white person, <laughs> that's what I said in the beginning, it's you are chased away. Also, if someone would come to my country and they would tell me this and this is wrong, but I have been doing that all my life, I, w I would also chase that person away because they don't know anything about my culture. So for me, it's like, it's up on me if I understand what is right to do and what's not right to do. Like, for example, we have a shamba and we, we plant vegetables there. Then we can harvest the vegetables and we get something because we are able to sell them. And maybe we can even go to Nairobi and sell them there because we get more money. And then we can use this money and we can take our daughters and we can send them to school. If our daughters are growing up and they are able to get education, they are also able to get a job. And then our daughters later on can take care of us. So I really have to understand the, the long-term um, benefits. You've hosted a number of guests before and then released them to the community. How is that period like normally? Um, actually, like in the beginning, when we first did the, the when we had the first um, camp, um, it was not as well received as it is today, because also the I think we all know that the the society is changing, changing um, also concerning FGM, like in like six years ago we couldn't talk about FGM on the road now we can do that so um, there are many things changing within um, along the years and also um, within the communities so people now realize that also take if they take the if the children are coming to the camp they are not we are not trying to take them away from them and actually as I said most of the parents they bring the they bring the kids themselves. We do have those cases, but they are very few. And it's always the children's department and the, the, the police who is involved. It's not us. So when we, when we end those camps, the parents, usually they are very thankful. And they come and they celebrate their children. They are really being appreciated and celebrated. They also, like, they take this as an alternative. And... Um, this is what made me very happy in uh, like in the last uh, camp in 2018 because you could really see how the parents are still celebrating their culture. And like we, on the closing day, we had a ceremony and um, like a, a cow was slaughtered. The kids, they were dancing the whole night. And then the next day, all the parents, the relatives came and the the priest came and uh, the chiefs and like the whole community was there and they were all appreciating their children and they brought them clothes they brought them presents and books and so many things so it was really we could really see that the this alternative um has been has been appreciated also by the community we have been programs that are aimed at reaching out to communities Yes, we do. Like, usually we have, like, concerning the children, like the kids, we have in the schools, we have school clubs, Zenduka clubs, where they talk about issues they are facing, and we are also um, visiting them. And um, then um, we also, like, what we are doing right now, we are coming together with other organizations, and we are trying to develop a program and whereby we have um, community exchanges because we realized that it's very important to go outside and see what's happening in other communities because Korea is not the only not the only community that's practicing FGM. So we just started a program. It's called Malaysia. It's a coming together with other organizations. Uh, they are called Mentors on Tour and the Umoja Women, 
and also men and FGM plus in Luca. And we focus just on community empowerment and we start, just started the pilot project and I think it was very successful. Now let's head to how you were able to interact with the community. You said you came from a different culture completely. You came to Kenya as a, I'd say, foreigner. And you came in and were able to integrate into this community. But there are, of course, some things that you had to do. How was the journey now after that, when you started running the organization and trying to blend in, not just into the community, but basically into the organization? How has it been from an outside perspective? To me, um, it was, I think it was a quite a long journey to really grow into the community because I, ne I can never change my skin color and I can never change my background and I can never change that my community is not cutting or I'm not cut. And um, yeah, so for me, it was important to just watch a lot and learn. Actually, I always, like we also have volunteer programs and we have many volunteers who come. And usually in the beginning, they want to come and they want to teach something. But in the end, they go And they have learned a lot because they 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 come and they experience and they see what's happening and how people are living so different. And I think it's something, I don't know, for me, it's like you can't explain those things. You have to experience them. But like the, les the lesson that I learned is really that community exchange can actually change people itself. I think for me, coming to Kenya was like the best decision of my life and it changed my whole life because now I'm like living in Kenya and I I'm I feel strange in my home country <laughs> and I feel strange eating bread I need ugali <laughs> so it's um yeah I think it can change people and it can change their perspective and it really for me it it taught me a very big lesson and I also believe that the people who um, we are working with and the community who where I'm, I'm, I'm living, they are also learning something from me. I think it's, yeah, it's a whole exchange and it's an experience which uh, is given from one to the other. Challenges that you faced. Uh, over time, of course, you interacted with different people. Um, are there some incidences that you could just remember that, You know, maybe there are mistakes you made. Maybe there are hard things that you had to face. Maybe there are decisions that you had to make um, so that you can make things successful or run in the organization or just basically trying to integrate into the community. Are there any challenges that you basically tried uh, to overcome or even faced and never, never successfully uh, overcame? I think there are, like everyone always faces a lot of challenges. Um, especially in, in this work with the communities. And there are many times where you want to do something and you plan something and then you see that it turns out completely different. Like for me, I, the first time I wanted to come, I wanted to help those children and I wanted to, to have this camp. In, that was in 2011, 2012, like when I first was uh, confronted with FGM. But it was not possible. So I had to see how the community lives, how, uh, what, they are, what is normal for them. And I also had to realize, like I was so angry at the people who are doing the cutting. I was, in the beginning, I was so angry. <laughs> And then later I realized that they are not doing that because they feel like they need to cut someone right now. Because, and it's a social norm. I had to understand that. And it also took me very long. And it's something I always tell the volunteers. Come here and watch. And don't expect you're going to teach anyone something. You're going to be taught a lot. So I think it's like the, the challenges we are facing, they, we are growing with them. And we are overcoming them just by um, trying to work together with the community. So you basically want them to learn themselves and see the importance of basically not cutting these children. Yes. Something that you remember that happened uh, during your work trying to integrate with the community. Um, 
I was approached by some people who also tried to do harm to me and uh, that was but that was in 2016 what happened I was um, standing on the road and actually I wanted to take pictures of the people who are who are who are cutting and they were escorting a girl and um, I was together with Tony Mobia and uh, he was like ah please take your phone away so I then I also I put my phone away but it was already too late and they told us me I'm hiding the children and I um I'm 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 forbidding their culture and uh they are all those kids are supposed to be cut and by that time we had 140 girls in the in the camp so they got very angry and but someone came actually an elder who has nine girls and two boys so and all his girls are uncut and he came and he went in between us because they the people also were talking kikuria and um they we didn't understand them so he went between us and he also told them they're not doing anything we're not going anywhere like those the people were thinking i want to take a video and i want to take it to the police and i never wanted to do that so they wanted you to delete the footage or they know actually they they know that they do something that's illegal because they had a cut girl among them coming from the field so that they, they were celebrating something which was illegal so they were th- they were thinking i'm going to take this uh, th- these pictures and I go to the police station and I report them. I told them I'm not doing anything like you can do whatever you want to and then someone like they they said they're even going to carry me and cut me but that person the elder really helped us and uh, then we were able to go and they also went their own way so never take out your phone <laughs> in front of those people <laughs> That's the lesson I learned. <laughs> yes. There are many things that you've experienced in terms of running campaigns, in terms of helping these children, running a school, trying to uh, work with other organizations from within and without Korea. What are the lessons that you would say that you've learned probably from the interaction with the community and some of the things that if I were coming from a different community, or a different culture, or a different country, and I want to work with the communities, trying to help them fight this vice. What are the lessons that you learned uh, over the years? Just maybe one or two. Mm, I think the most important one for me is that I'm not, you have to work with the community itself, and the community actually has to practice the work, and they have to want to do it. Like, I can't go somewhere and preach some, someone anything. That's the first lesson I learned. And I also never wanted to do that. So if you if you interact with the community and if you have the people on the ground who have, who like, it has to be their responsibility to achieve this goal. And if they see it's a benefit to them, they will also go and share it with other people from within their community or even with other communities. So basically for me, it's, so important to work on the ground and to really involve the people on the ground and to have them own the project. Um, and then I think the other thing, I never, I never came and I said I want to run a school, I want to run an organization, I want to do this and this. It just somehow happened. I only came because I wanted to understand why FGM is happening and I wanted to, to understand the culture. So I never planned on uh, building a school and um, having the camps for the children and all those things. It's somehow just like it came one after the other. So I think if you have something you're passionate about, just go and do it and you are able to achieve a lot. We want to bring this to a close. Uh, We want to bring this to a close now and... If someone wanted to reach you, uh, probably support your work, probably just have a conversation around FGM, or just visit uh, some of your projects, 
uh, how would they reach you? Uh, we have a website. It's called www.zenduka-ev.com. Then we are on Facebook, also under Zenduka EV. And on Instagram, also Zenduka EV. And on Twitter, also Zenduka EV. I think, yeah. And um, we are always welcoming people to join us. I think that's... Uh, Ending FGM is not something you can do by yourself. It's something the it's a community um, it's a community like activity and something the community has to approach uh, by itself. And um, yeah, it's not a one man show. That's something I can say. And we are always happy to receive uh, any support. Um, and we are always welcoming new visitors and people from within Kenya or without. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for being here with me today. Yeah, I think it's also been an enlightening moment for me. Um, so I'm very grateful for even showing up and uh, spending time with uh, me talking about trying to end FGM, but from outside the culture that's practicing it. So... Today you are listening to Antonia Vaskoviak, who is the founder of Zinduka EV, an anti-FGM organization that works in Kenya against FGM. You can get bonus materials, notes, and much more at www.kipainoi.com. K-I-P-A-I-N-O-I.com. Please remember, we all can do something. Go out and make a difference. For we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. Goodbye.